Hey, Patrick, it's Paige. How's it going? Hey, Paige. I'm all right. How are you? Good. Did you want to mute yourself or? I, you know. Oh, I'm sorry. Am I making noises? Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us for the uh, first uh, Meet and Learn event of the fall of uh, 2021. Uh, my name is Phoenix Matthews, and um, I'll be the presenter today. We are just at three o'clock, and so let's give folks a few minutes to um, join us before we get started. Thank you. Hello, Danielle. Hello. Nice to see you. We're just giving the folks a few minutes to come on and join us.
Okay, just a little bit after three. Let's give it one more minute. And my apologies in advance, my sons will be coming in from school in just a few minutes. So what will sound like a herd of elephants is just really two teenage boys. So my apologies in advance for any background noise that they create. Okay, let's get started. Uh, good afternoon, uh, everyone. Thank you for the first uh, attending the first meet and learn session of uh, the fall of uh, 2021 semester. Uh, I think I know most of you who are attending today, but uh, my name is Phoenix Matthews. I am the Associate Dean for Equity and Inclusion in the College of Nursing. And um, I also serve as a, a faculty in the Department of uh, Population Health. The meet and learn sessions are activities, continuing education and engagement activities that are sponsored by um, the college's equity and inclusion committee, which is a volunteer community committee of uh, faculty, students and staff from uh, both Chicago and the, the regions um, who are charged with uh, helping us move forward with the diversity strategic um, goals of the of the college. We initiated our meet and learn sessions last year, and um, we had a lot of wonderful pre presenters who were gave us our their perspectives on issues ranging from um, anti bias uh, in towards Asian American uh, communities, work with uh, engagement of uh, sex workers and health protection in that group. Um, working uh, with description of experiences in anti-bias training workshops and trainings on microaggressions, to name just a few. So today we'll be starting, uh, our kickoff event will focus on COVID-19 and the fight for health equity, addressing specifically the uh, needs of nurses of color. Give you a little bit of uh, context for and uh, for what we'll be talking today and covering. Uh, I'll be describing the impact of COVID nineteen pandemic on nurses. What we're information that we're knowing uh, know so far, and those of you who are practicing nurses who may be joining us, I really welcome your um, input on some of the experiences uh, that you've encountered as well. The goal really is to examine the differential impact of the pandemic on uh, nurses of color and to uh, describe strategies for improving coping and well being uh, in this population. So, for now close to two years, we have been in the midst of a global pandemic. Those of us here in the United States are well aware of the tolls um, that the pandemic has had on those of us individually here. Uh, in Chicago, across the nation, and, and globally. The time of the data that are shown here on the screen was January 9th of 2011, earlier in this year. And at this time, there was a great deal of promise. We were just on the verge of making wide, uh, widely available vaccinations. And it was highly anticipated that by the summer, we would be back to um, something resembling uh, our lives as we had previously known them. But uh, much to um, our surprise and dismay, the changes that we had anticipated in our, our management of the pandemic didn't materialize in the ways in which we had anticipated. These data are from uh, yesterday's tolls. So in the United States, we've had uh, more than 45 million cases and uh, of COVID-19, and we are currently at 725,000 people who have lost their lives uh, as a result of the, of the virus. Nurses, as we are well aware, have been on the front lines of not only this natural uh, national health crisis, but the health crises that have uh, impacted the nation in the past. Uh, nurses are indeed our, our boots on the ground as it relates to public health. In the early phases of the pandemic, nurses were 
um, very instrumentally involved with providing uh, testing uh, for, for COVID in um, traditional healthcare settings, as well as providing uh, outreach and engagement in communities and more non-traditional and community-based settings. As the, the vaccination became uh, available, again, nurses were a, a very much instrumental in providing vaccinations. Um, again, you, you see individuals working in, in um, less than ideal work, uh, working conditions in order to, uh, to serve in these roles. But again, as we had talked, I mentioned earlier, by midsummer, when most of us had anticipated that we would be um, living our some of our best summertime lives, um, the hospitals were again full, and the uh, nurses, the hospital setting was running low on nurses uh, due this to the uh, higher rates of uh, the pandemic in um, regions such as the West Coast, uh, Northern Plains, uh, as well as Southern states. So again, we were back. Uh, at, seeing levels of the pandemic and, uh, and infection hospitalization rates that we had seen very early on. This um, tremendous summertime spike uh, really um, underscored what has been a problem within the nursing discipline for more than two decades now, and that is the national uh, sh nursing shortage. Um, due to the aging population, including uh, the baby burn uh, boomers and our um, our extended life range, um, that we don't have the adequate numbers of nurses to meet the nation's healthcare needs. Um, and again, the pandemic has really underscored the urgency of this nursing shortage. Uh, with an existing shortage in place, uh, nurses had to work increased clinic hours during the pandemic, uh, which we know higher uh, numbers of hours work is associated with increased levels of stress. The, there's been a lot of discussion about the impact of the, sh the shortage, the high burden placed on nurses during the pandemic and what impact it may be having on our, our ability to safely care and adequately care for patients uh, in the healthcare environment. We are uh, well aware of medical errors and fatigue is a primary contributing factor to medical area errors. And so that was something that has been um, are very much on the forefront of our attention as we think about the impact of the pandemic on the healthcare environment. But equally as important has been the impact of the pandemic on the mental health of nurses themselves. This is a, a study that was published late last year that was a look, a surveying nurses who had been on the front lines of the pandemic. More than 50% reported significant uh, mental health uh, concerns, including depression, anxiety. A third of the respondents had symptoms of PTSD. There were a number of contributing factors that were reported, and including concerns about personal health risks, exposure to excess, excessive deaths, um, compassion fatigue, um, the lack of availability in many locations of appropriate uh, supplies of uh, PPEs, and the highly politicized environment of the nation's uh, response to the, the, the pandemic itself. As a result, nurses uh, in the face of the increased working hours, the uh, level of depression and anxiety um, have been withdrawing from the workforce at uh, record rates. And so the national shortage of health care uh, uh, nurses in the healthcare uh, system has even been more exacerbated uh, during this critical time. Although the impact on nurses as a whole uh, has been uh, devastating in many locations, what we do see is that there is also a differential impact for nurses of color. A recent article earlier this year talks about the um, adverse uh, impact on especially specifically about black nurses as they struggle with mental health support while battling COVID-19. So what are some of the unique issues that are, sorry, what are some of the unique issues that are um, faced by nurses of color? First of all, foremost, there are higher numbers of COVID-19, both infection rates and deaths in communities of color. As you look on the data from um, earlier this year, 
we see that with the exception of Asian Americans, uh, communities of color are twice as likely to um, have to die of uh, COVID compared to their white counterparts. And this is particularly true for Pacific Islanders as well as uh, Latinx populations. The uh, impact, negative impact on uh, health in um, communities of color is, uh, has been exacerbating existing inequalities, both in terms of uh, social economic status, uh, access to food and securities, and the impact of the drug um, epidemic on communities of color. What we have been seeing is higher rates of housing instability due to many individuals from communities of color being front, uh, essential frontline workers um, who, who um, were more likely to lose jobs or um, um, be laid off. We're also seeing higher rates of insecu food insecurity. And while and in the Black community, a uh, community that has been somewhat protected by the from the opioid pandemic, we see a surge in overdose uh, in the Black community uh, secondary to the pandemic. These inequalities that um, associated with COVID struck a chord with the United States, uh, many people in America, and but it shouldn't have been a surprise. There's a, set, a very old saying in the Black community, and it's reflected here. You see various uh, versions of this. But essentially, the idea is when Black America gets a cold, Black, uh, when America gets a cold, Black America catches the flu. So anything that negatively impacts the United States in general has a, a, debt, debt, a higher and differential negative impact on Black and other communities of color. This is the pandemic. So what we've seen with the inequalities of uh, the uh, pandemic, there's nothing new for those of us who are immersed in healthcare settings for in underserved communities and whose research is focused on um, health inequalities. We know that the pandemic is another example of what constitutes persistent and the moral health inequalities. Uh, just uh, last week, there was a story that one or made the rounds on the, on the news headlines about an uh, elderly black, black gentleman who was um, prematurely discharged from the uh, hospital due to a uh, lack of uh, insurance coverage or discontinuation of his insurance coverage. I didn't show the uh, images here, but they were available on social media and in the press. Um, the reason I didn't show it was because of the ongoing trauma associated with exposure to of images of neglect uh, and harm uh, visited on individuals who belong to communities in color, of color. But su suffice it to say, there was an image of an older gentleman still uh, with um, uh, medical tubing connected to his body collapsed in front of the, uh, the hospital setting. Why do we see these uh, persistent inequalities? Why is it that when America uh, gets a cold, the black and brown and Asian communities uh, develop the flu? Well, Chicago, like the rest of the United States, uh, has been plagued by long-standing sta racial segregation and concentrated inequalities. Most of our models of health uh, and understanding health and health risk behaviors for the longest time have focused on individual level contributors of health. If a person was uh, in poor health, it was due to their own individual risk factors. However, we know um, the last decade has uh, work research has been conducted and a greater attention has uh, been played to understanding the social determinants of health. Um, in, uh, issues such as poor education, segregation, poverty, lock, lack of uh, access to adequate healthcare uh, resources are the primary uh, determining factors of health inequalities, both what we've seen long uh, historically and those of which we're seeing during the pandemic. In Chicago, you'll see these maps that describe the a racial ethnic distribution of um, blacks in the in the in the city of uh, Chicago. Data start from 1970s. Those areas that are in blue are less than 10% black, and those areas in that are 
the darker shades are green, green or 80 to 90 to 100% uh, black. What we see in Chicago is as it relates to black and, and white communities as are two separate and distinct um, cities. But what we know is that these separate uh, parts of the cities are not, uh, are not equal. Milwaukee is a city that's very much a microcosm of what we've seen in Chicago. So when we look at risk factors and social determinants of, of health and well-being, we look at issues such as segregation. In Milwaukee, there, as in other places in the United States, there has been a dramatic increase in violence, uh, gun-related violence, uh, and in particularly in communities of color. The concentration of, uh, of individuals in the segregated communities um, has, as I mentioned, has not been an accident. You see here in, Chicago, in Milwaukee, such as this case has been with Chicago, is that the 54% of the excess homicides in Milwaukee are located in a 30 block radius. Again, a, a community that is uh, characterized by deep rooted racism, neglect and poverty. 40% of the residents live below the uh, poverty line. Um, and when we think about where people live, community individuals who are in these communities, such similar to Chicago, Detroit, St. Louis, and other large urban areas are there because of redlining and, and other uh, um, institutional uh, sources of institutional racism bias, which um, funneled individuals uh, of color into specific communities that were then uh, abandoned and neglected. So what we see uh, on the right is a, is a a heat map of where the COVID-19 cases were in Chicago. And again, you see almost a direct overlay of racial segregation, Black communities, and Black death. Due to racial segregation, um, nurses of color are more likely to live, both live and work in highly impacted communities. So nurses of color are not immune from what we see uh, among communities of uh, individuals from community of, of color in general. Individuals in black communities, 82% uh, that they know someone who has been hospitalized or died from COVID-19. In addition to the excess death experienced in the healthcare setting among nurses by nurses of color, they're also experiencing uh, excess deaths within their own families of origin and within the communities in which they reside. We know that uh, there are P symptoms of PTSD have been reported by a third of nurses. A lot of the P those symptoms are associated with the secondary trauma associated for caring for the most vulnerable. And although the re uh, research is not available that looks at these outcomes by race ethnicity, um, we can hypothesize that secondary trauma and subsequent PTSD would be higher among nurses in these high impact who are working and living in these high impact communities and healthcare settings. Indeed, uh, nurses in general and nurses of color have paid the highest tolls as it relates to um, um, death of the pandemic. And, and by that, I mean specific loss of, of their lives. Uh, 32% of all health care workers uh, who have died have been nurses. And by overall numbers, the highest number of health care workers in general, 36% <clears throat> were white um, and 26% uh, were black. But we have to put that in larger context when we, where physicians and nurses and other health care providers um, are significantly less likely to belong to communities of color. Um, while Blacks uh, constitute uh, approximately 13% uh, of the overall national po uh, uh, population, they're less than 10% in the workforce uh, as a whole. And they're represented at the rates of 26% um, in uh, deaths among healthcare workers. So more than approaching twice their population rates. We also see when we look at uh, spirit, uh, death rates among nurses in general, uh, specifically, we see the same pattern where 58% of nurses um, have died of COVID-19 related com uh, complications have been nurses of color. 
with the highest percentage of uh, being Filipino, uh, which is um, reflective of their high proportions in the, in the healthcare environment. So not only have uh, nurses of color um, have excess burden associated with caring for the most vulnerable, they have uh, uh, been rewarded, if you will, uh, with the loss of their lives. Other factors that have, uh, are unique for uh, nurses who from communities of color relate to uh, vaccine controversies. As I mentioned earlier, one of the primary factors contributing to poor mental health outcomes among nurses have been related to um, the politicization of the pandemic and treatments uh, associated with uh, the pandemic, including vaccinations. Um, vaccination rates were initially uh, low uh, among communities of color with higher le levels of um, um, mistrust being incited as reasons for the um, um, hesitancy associated with, with vaccinations. This uh, hesitancy uh, was not unique to um, the COVID-19 vaccine, vaccine, but comes on the heel of 200 years of mis uh, medical uh, racism that um, has been inflicted upon um, Blacks and other uh, individuals of color within the healthcare, as well as the uh, scientific communities. Uh, we call that uh, sort of uh, uh, earned mistrust. Um, of the healthcare environment, and it was played out uh, in the early stages of the pandemic. Although initially slow, nurses of color, and in this case, uh, Latinx nurses, have been very instrumental in reaching in, into communities um, and doing the work that is, has been needed to educate, increase access to, and um, help improve, help to inform decision making about individuals' vaccination practices. And as you can see, there has been a steady increase, these data are from Florida, in the uh, rates of um, uh, Hispanic populations who are vaccinated. So this, so progress is being, is, is being made. Nevertheless, in our politicized environment, um, Politicians are continuing to scapegoat uh, communities in color, of color uh, when it comes to the summer spike in the pandemic. Specifically pointing the finger at um, migrants uh, and uh, illegal um, uh, aliens in the, in the United States as bringing COVID in and the um, spreading false claims about black Americans uh, driving the vaccinations of uh, the uh, COVID-19 surge in, uh, in Texas. Again, these, uh, this environment has remained highly politicized, but research was conducted in um, September of, of this year. And it showed that as of September, 75% of the adult population in the United States have received at least one dose of the COVID-19 vaccine. And you, what where we're seeing is that the uh, Asian rates of vaccination uptakes are highest among Asian Americans and very equivalent between Latinx, uh, white and blacks uh, in the general population. But the report, what the report uh, highlighted though is that white evangelical Protestants uh, and those without health insurance were the least likely to receive a COVID-19 vaccination. Uh, yet we still see politicized uh, tropes such uh, as uh, blaming communities of color for uh, poor up uptake of vaccinations. So the unfair treatment of communities of color within the uh, media and um, public, uh, political arena. The vaccination controversy can, uh, can also extends to the nursing healthcare workforce. Um, there was a lot of initial concerns about hesitancy uh, among nurses of color. And uh, what I labeled was undue attention on the uh, hesitancy of nurses of color. Um, and with the differential lack of attention to um, individuals who were not hesitant, but who were anti-vax and in indicating that um, they did not intend to be vaccinated. Well, when you looked at the data between people who were hesitant, meaning that they were voicing, I, I'm going to wait and see, I want to see more information. I'm going to see how this all plays out over time. Highest percentage of 
nurses of color fell into that category, those categories, as opposed to in categories of, of flat out vaccination refusals. We see the um, data from earlier in uh, last year that was a reflective of that hesitancy, higher late rates of mistrust among um, uh, Black, uh, Latinx, and Asian, uh, I'm sorry, Black uh, Americans as compared to other populations. Um, increased, uh, Blacks were least likely to say that they would voluntarily be vaccinated at work if not required. This is a sample of nursing, which was very strongly correlated with the level of uh, mistrust. And as of this year, um, bl Black nurses were less likely to be vaccinated. So this is looking at data uh, in uh, combined data. But when we sort of look to the disentangle, what we're finding is that the highest rates of um, lack of vaccination was uh, um, concentrating in nursing among nursing aides, that sector of the nursing workforce, which has a tendency to be uh, less well educated and, and informed about uh, research as well as um, the, um, the FDA processes re related to drug approval. And it also showed that, showed that these individuals were again in areas of high concentrated uh, poverty. So it wasn't um, black nurses in general, it was a subpopulation, which was important for us to be making differentiations about when we're thinking about outreach and engagement efforts. But nevertheless, Black nurses have been somewhat demonized, even to the point where I was contacted by on several occasions by administrations, administrators at uh, UI Health Hospital to come and, and do something about the Black nurses. Um, that is in the context of the uh, uh, framing of white nurses' behaviors in a, in a very different light. Um, Miss uh, a nurse who was a vaccine refuser um, uh, was said to have come, succumbed to uh, misinformation. Uh, other discussions as act, um, um, exercising one's individual rights and freedoms as it comes to vaccination. Um, it's a tragedy when anyone loses their lives, but again, to have a public health issue that has been so politicized uh, in our, in our um, nation and especially within the nursing healthcare system um, is a, a further evidence of what we've been describing thus far of uh, structural and institutional sources of bias. In addition to working on the front line of the COVID-19 pandemic, nurses of color are also on the front line of the of the second pandemic, one that has been ongoing for a much longer period of time, and that is uh, systematic racism and the public health threat that that um, poses for the nation as in, uh, in, in general. Uh, there has, starting with the deaths of, or sort of brought in stark relief uh, with the deaths uh, last summer of, of George Floyd, um, Nurses, uh, especially nurses of color, have been out on the front lines of street protesting and advocate, advocating for social justice as it relates to uh, fair access to health and, the, and protection from police uh, brutality and other sources of, of violence. And again, why are nurses participating in such in these ways? Well, this sign here um, tells the story. Nurses, again, nurses of color are more likely to live and uh, work in areas of segregated, concent uh, concentrated poverty, where these acts of violence are most likely to be uh, perpetrated. So nurses of color have to ask uh, the same questions of other Black, uh, black mothers in this and country, will my son be next? So in addition to the extra stress in the healthcare environment, they have been dealing with the extra stress of, of community um, racism. But nurses and physicians of, of color are starting to speak out uh, more directly about the role of ra uh, the impact of racism um, in, in the healthcare environment, both in terms of the care that our patients receive, but also 
um, in their experiences in the uh, workforce. This uh, a nurse uh, who happens to be from the UK, uh, I included this because I, I, I thought it was very poignant one and very reflective of the experiences of a no, uh, number of nurses of color that I have spoken to here uh, in Chicago. She was describing the uh, mental health strain of the current healthcare and working in the her current healthcare environment. And she said, self-care for me meant leaving a job I loved but grew to hate because of the treatment I received in my place of work and the toll it was having on my health. She was talking about um, uh, instances of racism, both from health, uh, co-workers as well as patients. Um, and other uh, very senior uh, nurses, nurse um, scholars in London were talking about the experiences in the nursing discipline for Black nurses. Uh, Elizabeth Enyon spoke about not a glass ceiling for nurses, uh, but for Black nurses, a brick wall. So. I've been talking for a while now. Do we have anyone who has any questions or comments at this point? Okay, you can either add them to the chat box or come off of mute and ask directly. Okay, hearing none, I'll continue. In addition to uh, direct uh, forms of bias in the, in the work environment, uh, nurses of color also talk about social isolation and the lack of support for, for co from co-workers. Not, again, not it, just in response to the pandemic, but historically. Those of you who've heard me talk about the needs of our students in, at UIC as it relates to uh, a sense of belonging uh, and reduction of uh, social isolation. This practice extends from experiences at each of the level of the nursing profession, undergraduate, graduate disease, degrees, and as these nurses are attesting to, uh, continues into the practice setting. So how can we meet the ne needs of, of nurses of color? What types of things are needed? First and foremost, it's going to be important for us to utilize the uh, wealth of knowledge and experience to elevate nurses into leadership po uh, positions to help lead community solutions um, for the issues of, that we're seeing associated with COVID-19, but as well as other longstanding issues such as uh, maternal health uh, outcomes in communities of color. So elevate nurses into leadership positions, both in terms of working within community to solve community their community problems, but also in healthcare settings, again, where uh, nurses of color have been uh, marginalized as it relates to leadership uh, positions. We, we would think that that would be elevating the voices and the experiences and the leadership abilities of nurses of color would be something that would come to us sort of naturally. Um, but that hasn't been, clearly hasn't been the, been the case. And even more troubling is an issue that Usha McFarland uh, wrote about in uh, last month uh, in a really important uh, article. Uh, that she entitled it, Health Equity Tourist, How White Scholars Are Colonizing Research on Health Disparities. In that, in that article, she talked about health equity research now being very much in vogue and that the National Institutes of Health have an, announced uh, $100 million were going to be uh, released for research to address not just COVID specific health inequalities, but health inequalities um, in general. So there's going to be a, a massive influx of additional grant funding. Um, and the author goes on to say, while well, this should be great news, uh, research has indicated um, that there is now a, a gold rush mentality where researchers with little or no background in training in health equity research often white uh, and already well-funded investigators are rushing to scoop up grants and publish papers. Um, I've heard work with scholars of color for uh, the last two decades and there has been, um, before there was a lot of money in this area, um, there's been increasingly 
conversations about how scholars of color who've been work, doing this work for a number numerous uh, years have sort of been pushed to the side in terms of funding and other types of opportunities um, to prioritize those individuals, especially in nursing research, who are already funded. Um, NIH published an important report that showed racial bias in um, the awarding of NIH level funding. And so what we're doing is perpetuating uh, an existing problem um, that is longstanding. We are, um, there's bias at many levels in terms when it relates to uh, awarding grants and now, and then the prerequisite for receiving this new influx of money will be a history of prior funding. So again, what we're seeing is, and this uh, author has pointed out and called out, is that um, we, you know, we're able to document that re white researchers are now um, sort of capitalizing on the foundational work of black and brown resources, researchers was, without citing them or including them on grants or co-authored publications. Just uh, in August, there was a, a, a national scientific communication about just this very practice uh, in the journal of JAMA, one of the highest and most reputable uh, journals in the and highest impact uh, journals in the country. In that special uh, issue, a special theme on racial and ethnic disparities and inequalities in medicine and health outcome, they, commit, uh, they included five articles in this high profile special issue. Um, Usha again points out that not one of the five research papers published included a black leading or co-author and just one lead author was Hispanic. So again, another indication of um, silencing voices of individuals who have been long in the trenches um, in this area. Again, that's not to say that um, researchers from various backgrounds um, shouldn't be trained, involved uh, in health inequality research. It's a moral imperative. But again, when we see in instances of continued institutional sources of exclusion um, at, at some of the highest levels, um, it remains highly problematic. So what can, else can we do? Well, elevate black nurses, collaborate with black resource, researchers, and or probably more importantly, make opportunities for uh, grant leaderships for, for our uh, black and brown colleagues and Asian uh, colleagues who have been working in these areas uh, for years. Next thing is to check in on our colleagues. Uh, those of us who are in the trenches in the healthcare settings, ask the questions, how are you doing? Um, be willing to advocate on behalf of nurses in the, in the practice setting, scholars in the, in, in the research setting, and those nurses who are in community organizations who are doing the work. Check on one another, advocate for and address um, institutional barriers to their well-being and success. There are also nurses who are calling on creating a culture of self-care among nurses in order to um, be able to build resilience and cope with the ongoing pressures of nursing. There uh, is a recent program that was released uh, describing a mental health program for Black nurses. Um, it's, was, it's called Reset, Rethink and Reset. It has the goal of helping to relieve stress among Black nurses by um, providing counseling services, um, health promotion um, resources, and really helping to connect them to mental health uh, resources. This is an online environment that's available um, 24 hours a day, uh, seven days a week. These types of approaches are really important uh, sort of national level organization, online accessible uh, resources and the framing into self-care because uh, as a clinical psychologist, we've, well, we've known for uh, the last four decades that um, black Americans are much less likely to voluntarily seek uh, mental health treatment uh, and there are a number of reasons for, for that. There's been ongoing disparities in access. Um, 
uh, there, there was a, a, a lot of attention paid to this um, by a local organization in the Lawndale, uh, Lawn, Lawndale, I'm sorry, Lawnwood area, um, uh, when there was a report that looked at the difference in, in per capita uh, mental health providers in the northern parts of the city with some of the western and sub, uh, uh, southern parts of the city. There's also higher rates of stigma uh, among, about seeking mental health uh, treatment among Black Americans. And again, the lack of um, diversity and mental health providers also provides uh, barriers. So when we think about mental health, it's uh, also important to think about con uh, contextualizing it in, in non more non-formal uh, uh, and professional source sources of um, mental health care, such as psychiatry, psychology, uh, social work, psychiatric nursing, but also in addition, focusing on a variety of self-care activities that have been shown to have important impacts on mental health and well-being. That is uh, in engaging in um, pro-health coping responses, such as relaxation, meditation, um, mentorship, um, social support, religious um, uh, guidance and consultation, as well as uh, engaging in, in movement-based uh, stress, stress reduction activities such as exercise. The self-care and the for nurses I mentioned mentorship. And as we think about mentorship, I want to making sure that we're thinking about mentorship in the context of needs of black and other nurses of color. Um, this is what we're, I've ter, uh, termed the, the mentorship hierarchy uh, for nurses. We know that foundationally, all nurses have general levels of mentorship needs are, that are very similar. Professional development, learning the base skills, getting acclimated into the work environment. These are skills that are uh, needed of all nurses and um, or are partially achieved by uh, mentorship activity. Then at that next level, we see that there are needs of nurses based on where they're working. And may, may, may it be a specific department, such as the ICU, or a specific environment, a community health setting, or um, working in the, in the prison systems, or uh, in high need um, communities. Again, that's another level of mentorship and a need for addressing unique concerns of nurses in those, those areas. And then finally, on top of that is addressing the ne unique ne nurses of needs and needs of uh, Black and other nurses of color. That, and that is directly addressing issues related to exclusion, uh, social isolation, microaggression, uh, reduced leadership opportunities, um, and, and um, difficulties with interpersonal um, issues with patients and oftentimes students um, that they encounter. So as a mentor, uh, when you're thinking about working with, an, uh, with nurses from different backgrounds, think about this hierarchy and ask a appropriate questions that would help to guide you in the, your provision of, of mentorship. Another important uh, strategy is the creation of intentional communities among nurses of color. Many of you may be aware of Alicia Hart, who's a recent uh, graduate, uh, urban health uh, uh, school, urban health program student, graduate of uh, UIC in terms of PhD and um, uh, former postdoctoral uh, fellow here in the, in the College of Nursing. She was one of the founding members of Black Nurses Matter, which is an um, activist and online uh, community that is charged with, this has the charge of um, changing the narrative of research policy and practice as it relates to social and racial injustice in the Black communities. There are similar types of organizations that are um, being founded uh, and filling, filling a, a really important professional niche uh, among community, uh, communities of color. And um, the, these should be really well publicized and, and um, recommended to uh, our nurses of color as an additional resource. 
And then finally, it's important for us to uh, look as a whole um, at the discipline uh, of nursing. You know, the, the IOM Institute of Medicine wrote a, a recent report on the future of nursing that was in line with um, the American Association of Colleges of Nursing as it relates to the need to increase the number, the, the, the training and qual qualifications, as well as the diversity of the work, nursing workforce going, going forward. That has been, this has been identified as a, as a critical priority for the discipline. However, uh, NIH, including the Institute of Nursing Research, has been funneling uh, resources into uh, addressing the diversity in the uh, nursing pipeline, workforce pipeline. Um, despite the availability of scholarships, postdoctoral fellowships, and T32 grants, we see a persistence in the underrepresented underrepresented uh, minority students who are both enrolled in, gra graduating, and continuing on to higher education and leadership positions in, in nursing. So, you know, it, this really points to and, is, and has been linked to um, institutional deficits um, across uh, institutions of higher learning. So when we look at pipeline programs, and this is something that I've done a fair amount of work in as it relates to uh, training the next generation of health equity uh, scholars, we can see um, that these pipelines have numerous leaky uh, points. Um, that is where we start with a, a, a large bolus of individuals who are uh, entering the pipeline, but each step of incremental uh, um, advancement results into fewer people uh, of color making that next step. So we've started to look at what are some of the factors that are associated with that. Again, historically, we've looked at individual level models and predictors. Um, academic readiness, um, there, there's the idea that uh, all nurses of color who come into our system are in need of remediation uh, and professional development. And so the pipeline development programs are most exclusively focused in on those areas. It is the case that recruiting uh, students of color from urban areas that have the educational um, problems of Chicago, again, the e in those uh, segregated areas of concentrated poverty, one of the things that also is in alignment with that is substandard educational institution. And so um, <clears throat> there is, <clears throat> it is, can be the case that recruiting students from some of these underserved populations can re result in lack of readiness um, in terms of uh, the sciences and more mathematics, um, but other areas are, are equally as strong. But when we look at the, what, at the data, it is not the academic challenges that contribute to the vast majority of this leaky pipeline. It's what we're calling these extra academic factors. Um, those things that are associated beyond, that are beyond academic factors that are associated with higher rates of uh, dropout and, and dissatisfaction uh, within nursing educational programs. There was a, a study that was conducted in uh, 2015 that was looking at the experiences of black nursing students in predominantly white institutions. So when we think about UIC, we are a minority serving institution. We have minority serving status for uh, Latinx communities as well as uh, Asian Americans. And when we look at the diversity of our undergraduate student body, we don't think of ourselves as a predominantly white institution. Um, that's one of the ways in which uh, um, uh, institutional bias can be masked, right? What we're talking about is uh, predominantly white in institutions is when we're looking at the leadership, who are the, who, who are the faculty, who are the head administrators, who are the deans uh, of these schools, and in which case um, College of Nursing is a predominantly white institution, despite the diversity of our, our undergraduate student body. What, our nurse, what the nurses reported uh, in this qualitative study was the importance of social, emotional, and contextual factors as barriers to success. 
that yes, all students um, are challenged with our, our rigorous nursing criteria, uh, curriculum, but they didn't talk about the rigor of the curriculum as barriers to their success. They talked about the sense of isolation that they experience. They talked about um, a poor faculty uh, relationships. They talked about the need for support and the limited availability of mentorship or tailored resources that were specific to their needs. And they talked a lot about climate, the lack of commitment to diversity, the experiences of microaggressions, both in the classroom as well as the clinical practice um, settings. So again, while much attention as uh, resources have been dedicated to pipeline development programs, they miss the a primary driver of experiences and uh, poor uh, factors attributing to attrition among, uh, in this case, uh, black nurses. Okay. So in summary, we know that the well-being of our patients hinges on the the well-being of the and the availability of high quality nurses who are able to care for patients uh, from a variety uh, of backgrounds. What we're seeing in our current environment that nurses of color are uh, experiencing differential rates of stress due to a number of uh, unique risk factors uh, that are outside of their, uh, their own individual control. And so it's really imperative at this point for us to be thinking about uh, providing additional resources to nurses who are on the front line, as well as thinking about the pipeline of, of um, students who are currently in the pipeline who are not immune from some of the same tr issues that are being expressed by, by nurses in the practice settings. And in order to achieve that, it will require institutional and cultural changes uh, in the overall discipline in, of nursing, uh, in the hospital and practice settings, as well as in educational settings, such as the College of Nursing. So let me, as an honorary nurse, but not quite a nurse, uh, let me uh, applaud all of you who are nurses or actively involved in the training of our next generation of nurses for, for all of the work that, that you have done and, and will continue to do. So thank you. I'll stop sharing now and that will leave us with plenty of time for discussion. Dr. Matthews. Hi. Who's got anything to say? Hi, Dr. Matthews. Can you hear me? Sorry. Hold on, let me fix my... Dr. Matthews, can I you hear me? I said it all. Dr. Matthews, can you hear me? It looks like Danielle, you trying to say something? Yeah, can you hear me? I hear you. I'm Maybe sorry. I'm put it in to... chat. Danielle, I can hear you. Um, oh, you I, hear I'm not me? able to hear you either. <laughs> Maybe the issue is, oh, oh, ha, the issue's with me. Okay. Hi, Dr. Uh, Matthews. Um, okay, sorry about that. Oh, sorry, take one second. LaDawn, it was completely my fault. Sorry to freak you out. No worries, no worries. Okay, um, Okay. <laughs> yeah. So your your presentation is so informative and so updated and so beneficial, and I really appreciate it. Um, I just like um have some questions or comments. Um, yeah. so I'm kind of like I didn't quite comprehend hand the um pyramid uh, model you showed us regarding to the mentorship. So what's the hierarchy like the color nurse on the top and then okay. ICU nurse in the middle and other all other nurses as a base uh no let me let me explain yeah, this slide okay yes yeah, sorry for the lack of clarity there so no um what that means is that there are oops that if you think of this pyramid as mm -hmm. mentorship needs of nurses and when we think about how to tailor the uh, mentorship needs of nurses, we can think about it. Here's one model for thinking about it, is mm -hmm. that foundationally, 
all nurses need some general types of mentorship. I mean, and that includes nurses of color, male nurses, nurses from very different backgrounds about what it means and how to be a nurse. And there are lots of mentorship that's, uh, uh, experiences that are needed for that. In addition to that foundational nurses um, level of mentoring, there will be some nurses based on the, the discipline that they go into um, that will need unique kind of mentorship. Because for example, ICU nurses now in the current COVID-19 environment have some of the highest level of stress, burnout, PTSD among all nurses. And that's because of the excess death that they are seeing as a mm -hmm. part of the role as an ICU nurse. Mm -hmm. it, to discipline specific kind of mentorship, we some nurses may have unique needs because of their social identities, whether that's uh, racial ethnic, whether that's gender, whether that's social organization, uh, 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 sexual orientation, or immigration status. So then when, when we think about it in this way, um, we think about that everyone needs foundational uh, levels of mentorship, and it becomes more specialized and you, uh, as you go up in terms of mentorship needs. Is that that now. Thank you. Thank okay. you so much. You're and welcome. Our, uh, second question is, you mentioned that um, like the minority, especially um, like Black nurses, lack of um, Black psychologists, so mm -hmm. maybe lack of the culture competence. Uh, mm -hmm. competence. So I'm just wondering, like, uh, in addition to culture competent, do you think the political influence would matter too? For example, like in Illinois, um, maybe more people more prone, like more um, easily to agree to get a vaccine. And in Southern states, because of political influence, they may just turn, reject the idea. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I, th I think that's a little bit, it's an important question, but it's a little bit different from what I was trying to get at when I was talking about a mm -hmm. willingness to access mental health services. Mm -hmm. um, the Historically in the United States, mental health services for were mostly in the ways that we think about them now in, in terms of the helpful, supportive, proactive types were uh, uh, were exclusively for uh, wealthy middle class and typically white uh, individuals. Mental health for among communities of color and lower income individuals mm -hmm. was used as historically as a weapon, and and typically that was in the in the form of child protective services, um, parents of color being mandated to services. Um, in, in order not to lose their, their children. And so in that context, many, many years of lack of trust going to a mental health provider for help and having that information, having that information being used to separate you from your children, um, as you can imagine, ha has created a great deal of, of trust, uh, mistrust, appropriate mistrust of mm -hmm. that, of that uh, area of uh, healthcare. Okay, thank you. Uh -huh, uh, thank you for those. Uh, third question was about um, the low uh, vaccine uh, vaccine rate for the nursing aides. Yes. Uh, so to my understanding, uh, I had an ICU rotation this summer and I work at a hospital right now. So like vaccine is kind of like mandatory by the, um, by the hospital. So just kind of like our epic training that everybody has to do it. Kind mm -hmm. of it's like criteria for your job performance uh, evaluation or something. I don't know, just like mandatory. Maybe that's yeah. just recent. Uh, it's that's something that's being very actively debated uh, across the country. And so uh, recently their vaccination has been become uh, mandatory mm -hmm. for um, for members of the healthcare workforce. Um, these data that I showed were a little bit older. The, the mandatory mm -hmm. vaccination is within the last three months, mm -hmm. uh, three months. Um, these, these were before that time. Yeah, the data update every day. 
Yeah. 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 Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Uh huh. Thank you. Comprehensive. Yeah. Good job. (laughs) Thank you. Other questions, comments? Cecilia, I saw you come off at at, uh, one point. Thank you. I just always appreciate what I learn from you, and um, try. I'm trying really hard to connect some of the dots on mentorship. Mm-hmm. And I'm not sure if I'm recalling this correctly, but um, I remember that um, Susan Corbridge was uh, speaking to the faculty probably seven or eight months ago about the need for. Um, faculty to mentor other faculty and that that um, that um, uh, I I think I'm recalling that she shared her story of um, being a mentor for faculty of color and that that relationship was productive and satisfying she thought for for both Mm -hmm. Um, and I'm I am aware that um, um, there's probably not enough faculty of color to mentor all the faculty of color that need mentoring. And so just trying to think about uh, how I might be able to contribute to the growth and development of a a faculty member of color if that's requested of me and how I can do that in a way that's supportive and humble and caring um, and really wanting to serve in that role or and not really sure how to connect in such a way that um, it might be helpful to junior faculty. So I'm just, just my space where I'm where I'm um, sitting in our discussion today. Let's uh, tap into some of the collective wisdom uh, of, of the group. What are some of your thoughts about uh, preparing ourselves to be appropriate mentors for individuals who may be outside of our own social group, social identity groups? I can, can I contribute my personal experience? Yes, please. Um, um, so I actually was a assigned uh, for two mentee this semester, actually through two different routes. So one is from Khan. Um, so I don't have like say which mentee I want. So basically we fill out a form and there's, there's a faculty would match based on what kind of criteria, I don't know. So that's one route. And the other route was um, through the UIC Khan alumni uh, office. Mm-hmm. So I think the same idea, you fill out form and then there's a like um, director in the office match you. And then like you have to, like I have to meet the mentee four times a uh, semester. Oh yeah. And then mm-hmm. in, in the end, so the mentee would uh, fill out like a quick survey and see if you're satisfied or not. So, I mean, like we don't have like, like, you know, proactive, I want outside the box. I want a like, different identity. We don't have the choice. We just based on like, what's your interest? For example, uh, like I work as a CNA. So the other, my mentee works as CNA. So they try to match like your experience, interest are similar. And oh, another mentee wants to go down the DMP route and I'm on the DMP track. So they're based on this criteria. Yeah. So let me clarify just a little bit. I, I think that it's, so the system for how we're linked um, to, to you did a nice job describing the system with how we're matched um, with, with some mentees. But I, I think with all types of mentorship, how do we prepare ourselves to be a good mentor? Oftentimes it, it's one of those things where we just do what was done to us. Um, and sometimes that works, but probably it's not best in all, in all cases. So how do we understand what are some of the unique needs of, of in this case, we'll, we'll, we'll say um, 
uh, junior faculty of color. I think a lot of extensive reading uh, on the, the literature, there's a, a, a very deep literature that describes the experiences of faculty of color in, in my uh, predominantly white um, environments. There are um, opportunities for training programs that um, for mentorship in general, and then really thinking about seeking out mentorship programs that focus on increasing one's skills, abilities, and knowledge and resources for mentoring across, across difference. The other thing that I would say is the importance of communication uh, of our, as we enter into our men, mentoring race, uh, our relationships. Sometimes the mentors choose us or mentees choose us and sometimes we choose our, our mentees. And so looking for relationships that uh, organically happen is important, but it's also vitally important if you're in an, an, an arena in which you have access to um, um, a board or an organizational body or steering committee, um, is there anyone, a junior faculty that you could invite, sponsor, mentor into that environment and advocate for um, you know, progressive involvement in, in leadership. So there are many different ways. Sponsorship is one of the key ways in which uh, faculty of color are differentially left out of experiences of, of, of non-minority faculty have. Why is because we, we have a tendency to be, be joined to people or to gravitate people who have similar experiences uh, as we do. And so when thinking about it in very, very intentionally, I've been saying this a lot recently, if you sit at a table of leadership, sp invite, sponsor, promote, and advocate for diversity in those spaces, not la 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 around the table, by, but by action, bringing someone with you and ensuring that they have a positive experience while they are there, okay? That's sponsorship is critical. We can think of sponsorship in a thousand different ways. Who do we ask to give guest lectures? Who do we ask to be on student com uh, dissertation committees? Who do we nominate for awards? Who so we can be uh, very strong mentors in a sponsorship type of way that might not that might be a little bit different from sitting down to to with a, like a tr more traditional type of ment mentor mentee type of relationship. Um, but in that more traditional format, I think it's uh, really important to um, ask questions. Right, when I was a nurse, these were the mentorship needs that I had, or when I was a young beginning clinical psychologist, this is what I needed. My, my guess is that given the 30 years since I graduated and the fact that you and I have had different life experiences that you might have different mentorship needs than me. So in order for me to be most effective, let's do two things. Let's identify what the mentorship needs are that you have, determine in which of those I can help you address, and then expand your mentorship circle to include other people who can help you with the things that I'm not exactly equipped to do. Now, that's not to say you say, oh, we'll bring in somebody of color to do all the things I'm afraid to do. No, we don't say that, right? But you have that open and honest conversation. I can provide this. I think we need to identify someone else to build your network and to help you with those areas. Don't, and but can remember to keep checking in on those issues as well. Don't delegate, relegate to the other person. Make sure that they are aware that you are cognizant of them, that you consider them, and you know that it's important to that person. So that was a pretty long-winded explanation. Uh, I, I hope it helped. Thank you. Actually, um, Dr. Matthews, you kind of legitimate my uh, mentorship <laughs> because I am new on uh, this role and I didn't know what to do. Actually, I'm actually doing what you just described and I'm introducing my mentee into my leadership role 
I'm the vice president of USCIHI Leadership uh -huh. Board. So I'm training uh -huh. her um, how to like um, organize events, how to reach out, uh, sponsor uh, lecture um, speakers. And so after upon my graduation, she's gonna replace my role to increase right. UIC con enrollment uh, with IHR committee. Uh huh. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. Great. Brandy, I know you give a lot of thought to these issues. What are you thinking? I am. I am just out. I get out now. Your parents I'm dropping <laughs> off at Hebrew school. <laughs> um, I was thinking about it. Let me, let me, give me one second so I can collect my thoughts. But I do have a lot of thoughts. So hold on one sec. <laughs> okay. So we, we'll come back to you. Paige, what are you thinking? Well, first of all, uh, Cecilia, thank you so much for asking that question. And because your answer, Phoenix, was so helpful to uh, try and figure out, you know, on, on different levels, asking what they need and then trying to connect to connect different, um, for me to be students, because I'm still junior faculty. I'm so junior when it comes to Cecilia, for example. Uh, but it's, it was really helpful to hear, like on different levels, to, think, to be have those honest conversations about, you know, here's where I can help you, but here's, you know, based on what you're saying and um, that you need, that try and connect you to uh, resources, you know, that that could actually help you. So, I'm I'm really excited to, to hear that advice. Thank you so much, Phoenix. Mm -hmm. Great. So, um, this is Randy. Sorry about that. Um, I guess when I was think I was thinking about what all of the different people were saying, but I think Phoenix, you posed a question about how to address it when we have different life experiences. And the first thing that I thought about was just um, listening and asking, just kind of asking our students and our um, and other junior faculty people who have listened to me like you, you know, um, um, have really helped to guide me. And so I think that when I've done that with my students and I'm able to be quiet, I'm, I find that I'm more receptive uh, in responding to what it is that they're looking for rather than me necessarily guiding. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm responsive to what they're looking for. Yes, yes. Other thoughts, comments on anything that was covered in the presentation? One thing that came to mind for me was because I worked so long at Lurie Children's and uh, you know, very, still perpetuated very disproportionate representation of nurses you know of, of who of the diverse population we serve so um i really really struck me thinking about uh nurses of color you know in isolation you know what i think they started recently um equity and inclusion um efforts but i, I felt like the it was only through friends that it was more about like uh, helping to serve better patients but i kept thinking what about you know recruitment for um you know, more nurses of color, but, but what what would a nurse do, you know, that feels isolated in a setting like that, where they're they're really a, a minority, you know, or, or what can be done for them? Well, I think you're on, on track with it. <laughs> Diversify the staff, <laughs> right? Yeah. There's an idea in the social sciences literature of a critical mass, and they say that uh, research has shown that there needs to be at least 15% diversity uh, in, a, in, a, in a environment as a minimal standard, as well as clear messaging about equity, inclusion, and belonging, and very targeted efforts to make sure that, you know, issues of DEI are front and center. So even as it, if it remains a relative 
smaller minority, again, that's our minimum standard. We want to get up and above that. That's why we've established our benchmarks for specific underrepresented minorities at 15%, is that that, that critical mass, whereas there's enough people there to support the people who are there, there's enough people who are there if that outside people who might be considering it can see themselves. And then there's enough that's happening in the climate that suggests safety, even though there might be still a relatively low proportion of the overall staff that are from diverse backgrounds. So it's, it's institutional change, really, that's required. Um, with the institutional change, I was wondering, I thought about this before, we have the bridge to faculty um, program, mm -hmm. and I'm wondering if there is a, like a bridge to PhD or first a bridge to nursing. I mean, I know of like National Health Service Corps and different programs and things like that, but um, now I'm finally parked. Hi. Um, Hi. Sorry. Um, but are there, pro you know, there are some students that we see that are just so amazing that you would love to see go on and, and eventually get their PhD. Um, but programs like that, uh, are there programs like that that I'm not yeah. aware of? Yeah. Um, the Bridges builds on, a, a, again, a, a, a proven strategy from social sciences of, of the cohort or posse effect that you bring in several people who are similar at the same time, they create their own sort of critical mass. It, and then you build some scaffolding around uh, supportive resources um, and, and engagement and mentorship so that um, in, in increases their likelihood of success. So the bridges to the faculty is that we have three, we, you know, up until recently, we had three in the College of Nursing, but they're part of a larger group of now some 30 uh, Bridges fellows across the campus. So within unit, but also doing some really intentional work across units to make to make those connections, because it may be that not in not any in any single unit, you're not likely to right away get to that critical mass, but if they're linked into a mass, a critical mass at the university level, a supportive network uh, at the university that helps. Um, the urban health program, I think is really important and, and instrumental to that. Cerise has done a, a phenomenal role, uh, job and for years in terms of creating co uh, community there. But, you know, Randy, what you're talking about, again, goes back to this issue of sponsorship. You said there, you see students who you think they're phenomenal and you just, you know, would love to see them move fo forward into the PhD program. Tell them that. Tell them that every day, every day. When they get a C, tell them that. When they get an A+, plus, tell them that. When they do something phenomenal in the community, help them to recognize their value and their importance and be their sponsor. Um, up until, I've, I've said this in a presentation a couple of years ago, I've only had two black uh, teachers. That was in second grade and that was in sixth grade, right? My sponsors, and which is tragic, right? But I got here via mentorship and which has meant my sponsors have been non-Black, non-Brown, and with exception of one teacher, non-Asian. Um, and so all of us have that ability to provide appropriate mentorship and sponsorship, right? Again, some of those people I chose, but most of the time they chose me. Um, and my weird and introverted self, I was always trying to squiggle out from under it, but they didn't let go. And they just kept saying, you can do it. So all of us knowing that sometimes there's nothing magical than more magical than belief. And belief translates across cultures. So that communication in their ability to be successful is vitally important. I would, so, I would so like to follow up if I can, because yes. I think this is, 
um, to hear to hear you say that you've had two black teachers. When um, in the Springfield campus, we we do get a um, portion of our students who choose to come to us as their second choice, mm -hmm. and and uh, it's primarily our source of diversity um, in in our central campus. And the students notice. And I remember the first fall that I was teaching um, at at the Springfield campus and one of the students of color came up to me and said, you know, I can't help but notice that there's nobody here um, from a diverse background. And I, my response was, yes, we know. And it is very important for us um, to have a faculty that represents all of us. And uh, the problem is that even in the beginning pipeline, there are fewer um, um, nurses of color, and we're trying to change that in terms of our admission policies and working really hard with our holistic admission policy. But we need we need students to envision themselves with us. And I said, I look forward to the time I teach with you. <laughs> and I specifically said that. And this was a first semester junior in her second week, you know. And um, I think that it's really important that faculty plant that seed and say, That's yes, nice. we know. And come help us, come help us with that. <laughs> come be part of us. And we would we would welcome that. And I think that getting that message planted early. Mm -hmm. is really crucial. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Cecilia, that's wonderful. The only thing I would add on, again, now I just put my psychology hat on. That was a very appropriate sort of cognitive response. But now I put my psychology hat on. And what that student was asking you about is, am I going to be OK? Is there in there's no one here who's like me that's going to make sure that I'm OK? And so the second half of that wonderful response might have been, and until we get the diversity of faculty here that we need, you can come to me and I will make sure that we help you get the things that you need. Thank you. That's very helpful. Yeah. yeah. So think about that. The, what the students are saying is one thing, <laughs> but what they're what they're meaning <laughs> is here, right? And so in your responses, try to try to address both those things. Yeah. I yeah. think it's, it's Natasha. Yeah, um, Natasha. Another really big piece of this is like the intentionality, you know, like mm -hmm. to be intentional about selecting students who are black, right? And intentional mm -hmm. about who we're doing our research projects with. Um, and intentional about maintaining relationships and supporting them. And that really needs to, like students feel that. And I'll be presenting in a couple of weeks on how to support black research teams and supporting students because their needs are quite different. And I think the first thing as a predominantly white faculty is listening, but also being intentional, intentionally seeking those students out is critical. Now, you have any advice about that, Natasha, in the in the how to seek out? I think that was a part of Cecilia's earlier comment that I may not have addressed fully. I mean, students are there. I think they're willing, they want to. Um, if you are teaching and you notice a student that you really click with or you know, a student of color that mentions that they want to be engaged in research, reach out to them, send them an email. I think part of intentionality is follow through and follow up. Right. So I think, but it goes back to listening. So you have to listen for those opportunities and what students are interested in. Um, I think also visibility is key for, for students and faculty. So putting yourself out there, presenting, saying, showing that you're someone that supports DEI um, initiatives, I think is critical as well. One of the things I think that people um, um, underestimate the power of is uh, related to just what Natasha was saying, the, the visibility and 
the knowledge that you are somebody, even though you, they may never talk to you, you are somebody who they view as supportive of DEI issues. And then again, a number of years ago in the safe space, when they were, we were working to really improve the environment for LGBTQ populations, you know, there were uh, faculty who, and staff and who went through the training, uh, got a sticker to put on their, their door, right? Something as small as putting a postcard or a sticker or, a, you know, a favorite slogan or, or something else that indicates where you stand on diversity, equity, and inclusion goes a long way, right? As a member of the LGBT community, you know, if I walk into, I'm walk, going my walk um, and I'll, I pass churches all the time. And I always notice on the churches, on their welcome to our church, the ones that have the little rainbow flag. Now, I may never ever go to that church, right? But I walk past thinking I could be welcome here. And if someone asks me about a church, I, you know, I could refer them there, right? And it's so, it's, it's just one of those things that uh, display matters, right? Um, not performative display, but real display that is followed by action, intention, and, and, and advocacy, I think is really important. All right, Sarah, you. Thanks for joining us. Anything you want to add? Um, I cannot wait to watch the recording of this because I want to see what, what I missed when I was. I apologize for being late. I was um, doing a simulation with students, but um, I, I just think that all of all of the conversation I've heard continues to reinforce why the advancing advancing racial equity. Um, efforts for every department in the university are really important. So um, make sure that you're doing whatever mechanism your department is, is using to kind of evaluate what your thoughts are on that. Um, I know our department's using a survey. Um, I'm not sure if all departments in the college are doing that, but, um, and, and the word that keeps coming to my mind over and over again is champion. Um, like. Mm -hmm champions for um, for underrepresented students and mm -hmm. students for underrepresented groups. And, you know, I, I know that I've had mentors that I felt like were, were champions for me and, and helped me and helped kind of drive me forward. Um, but I, I also have white privilege, so I don't have to constantly feel like I have to justify why I'm there. Um, and, and I have that privilege already. We need to champion the people who don't come in with that privilege. Um, that, that's just what kept coming to my mind. And I don't know if I vocalized it the right way, but. Yeah, yeah, it did. It did, very much so. Thank you. Cecilia put something important into the chat box. I want to I want to highlight. Um, she was saying that uh, the pronouns, listing the pronouns on our with our names, um, it has been students feel that uh, as in very as being very supportive and positive, even if it's a non, even if it's a cisgendered pronoun. It's the recognition that you understand that there are differences in pronouns that, and that each of us has the right to uh, identify in, in the ways that we do, right? And so participation in that, that's, that's fantastic. So thank you for giving that really concrete example of a signifier or symbol, uh, Cecilia. Well, we have reached our time. Oh, yep, Randy, you know okay, the I just, is that Sorry, I just wanted to go back to, I mean, We've, we've been so many different places with your talk and it started with, you know, um, COVID-19 and, right. and, um, and I wanted to also just acknowledge um, or ask, well, so I, I'm on two different committees. One has to do specifically with DEI and the other one has to do with uh, mental health of students. And the interesting thing that I've noticed is that neither are talking about the other. And, um, and, um, and I really appreciated um, how you brought both into 
into your lecture and, or not lecture, but into your presentation. And wanted to know if you had any recommendations um, uh, for things either that you've done um, when you've taught, uh, um, not just like weird, but things that you can, I don't know, say, or things that you've heard. I don't know, it's like recognition of, of the emotions going on with all of these students because they are experienced, they're students. And so they're not nurses yet, right? But, but they're feeling similar burdens. So how are, we, how are we as faculty to these students going to support them emotionally or I don't know? Do you know what I'm saying? I absolutely do. Okay. I got a mental picture of that as you were talking. Um, it's the need to support our, our future frontline nurses and they're looking at the front line and it's scary, right? And they also know the challenges that they're having right now in their own positions. And so they not, may, not, may not be as sturdy um, as they might otherwise be. And so the, there's that, what we call the secondary trauma, right? We, I talked about that earlier. And I think it's fair to extend that to our current nursing stu uh, students as something that they're hearing about, they're seeing in their preceptors, they're seeing about in the in the media, and they're worried and anticipated and anticipating that for themselves. And I think that's a really potential source uh, 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 of attrition if we're not very very careful and paying attention to it. And I think we need to speak to it, right? I think we need to speak to it exactly. Is that this can, may, is maybe a frightening time to be pursuing a, 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 the profession of nursing, something you've wanted to do and loved your whole entire life, but we're, we're in a moment, right? And how do we you know, get you to the point where you, you're, you're ready, you're resilient, and that here's what the nurses are learning now that's been helpful, taking care of mental health, self you know, self-care, uh, being in an institution that cares of, ha, is adequately staffed. So what are the risk factors for the nurses right now? Um, and, and then, you know, how can you, you arm them with that information so that they are prepared? Thanks. There are a couple, I was acknowledging a couple of people had to drop off. So this was great. Thank you all so much for your participation. Thank you all for allowing me to call on you and <laughs> pick your minds uh, about what's been going on. All right, so um, Natasha might be our next, and, and, and her, her team might be the next one. Uh, LaDon will send out the um, uh, reminders about the next meet and learn. So hopefully we'll see all of you here coming soon. And, um, Tell all your friends, I think it's the best party in town. All right, <laughs> thanks so much. Have a good rest of your evening. Bye now.